You never hear about the ozone layer very much anymore, do you? Why is that? There's a reason for that. Is it because it was all a hoax? Absolutely not. <laughs> Had you go in there, didn't I? Yeah. So that problem was solved by scientists using science. But now we've got this giant climate issue and all these people who refuse to believe the thousands of world-class scientists that are warning us that nature is yet again trying to tell us something urgent and serious. And we have to ask those people, just how much do you really care about your children and grandchildren? We, scientists, saved them and their future, at least on the ozone problem. But now for the rest of us who actually care about doing something good for the world, we have two magnificent and epic challenges facing us. One is to completely stop, not just decrease or curb all carbon emissions into the atmosphere, zero them out using the solarization of the world. The other one is to go way beyond that, beyond zero, to negative emissions, pulling massive quantities of carbon out of the atmosphere to the tune of tens of billions of tons a year and sequestering them permanently or on long time scales. Now this provides plenty of work to go around for all who are interested, regardless of your field or discipline or expertise or passion. So there's actually kind of good news to look forward to that there's a lot of good we can do in the world. There are ways, last point I want to make is that there are ways to accomplish those things, especially on the one about what I call minus C, negative carbon emissions, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, which leads to what we can call climate restoration. You likely haven't heard much or anything about that yet. But the good news is there is some real progress on, that, on those fronts. You can help promote these, these ways of getting carbon out of the atmosphere as we find and further develop them. You can help in the finding and the further developing of them. So I am going to get your questions. Modern technology. Look, all your questions are they're right there. <laughs> so keep them coming. Keep them coming. <laughs> all right. So first question, I'll, I'll just kind of exercise the discretion to prioritize here. Okay, your two magnificent epic challenges, you know, zeroing out all carbon emissions and then going big time negative. How are you going to pay for that? And how much does it cost? <laughs> all right, you ready for the answer? The way we're going to pay for it is the same way we now pay for all our military largesse and bailing out already wealthy financial establishment, i.e. with money, <laughs> our money. <laughs> Only in this case I'm talking about now, it'll be good money after good. Okay? <laughs> now as far as how much does it cost, the answer is a fortune. <laughs> but that's nothing compared to the cost of losing everything, our environment, our habitable home planet. And in fact, there's this marvelous, wonderful saying that everybody should just memorize. And it comes from Herman Daly, who wrote a book called Steady State Economics. We should all remember this. The economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. <laughs> you ain't got an environment, you ain't got an economy. <laughs> so, okay, well, let's see. Uh, I answered that one there. Uh, how, about, uh, how about the next one? Oh, here's one. We weren't even born yet when that big deal about the ozone layer being destroyed, that, that big scare happened. Can you tell us a little more about that problem and how they fixed it? Yeah, good, <laughs> great question. Uh, okay, well here, now, now it's time for some pictures. <laughs> okay, so fortunately, thankfully, the ozone layer is still there. <laughs> it's that middle layer there. Uh, and O3, you know, is the chemical symbol for the ozone molecule which has three atoms of the element oxygen. It's about 10 to 15 miles up in the stratosphere. 
Now, uh, the problem was that we had invented and were manufacturing ingenious specialty chemicals that had various purposes. They were the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, halons, they were used in, as fire retardants, and so on. But it was suddenly discovered that these things were destroying the ozone layer at an absolutely breathtaking pace. And so, we got them banned. We got them phased out and banned. This was the major triumph so far of international policy, bringing together environment and business. Now, you have to know, though, that <laughs> since the chemical industry had to change a lot of stuff, they opposed us and ridiculed our research and findings for years until, finally, the writing on the wall became so acutely clear that even they came around and became the strongest supporters and sponsors of our work. So much for the ozone, I think. Uh, how about this one? Ah, okay. Oh, yeah, we had a couple people who sent in that question, actually. Yeah. All right, how about this one? Uh, here's a big question. Can we get at least a sneak preview of some of these things you are saying about pulling carbon out of the atmosphere on a heroic scale? Okay, I'm going to just rattle off five or six things. Uh, there's not enough time to get into it, and this is frontier stuff, so it's, uh, we can only kind of give you the barest outline right now, but it's, a, it's cause for hope and interest, okay? All right, well, aggregate for paving and for buildings. Turns out there's enough demand for that in the world today to account for about half of the carbon we need to be pulling out of the atmosphere every year. We need to be pulling out roughly, we need to pull out more every year than we put in. Humanity collectively is putting in about 35 to 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year. So we need to pull out, say, 50 billion, at least until we get emissions way down and climate restoration is assured. But so techniques for extracting carbon out of the atmosphere and making aggregate for buildings and paving is, is, uh, is a huge one. Regenerative or restorative agriculture, of course, is huge. Although the farms aren't huge, like the ones we have, they destroy the soil and release tremendous amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. We need many little, you know, organic, low or no-till intensive farms, and people are gonna say, oh, that's not economic. Well, the response to that is, it's time to fix economics then. <laughs> So, okay, uh, let's see, another one here. Um, marine permaculture arrays. Kelp is like the fastest growing thing on the planet, and they have very rich communities, and there are ways of greatly enhancing the extent and intensity of kelp. This is just one example that a, a local fellow here is kind of leading that effort. Perovskites. How many people have heard of perovskites? Okay, they're miracle rocks first discovered in the Ural Mountains, traditionally considered the border between Asia and Europe, that have amazing properties, which both promise very high efficiency for photovoltaics, solar electricity, and very high ability to sequester immense amounts of carbon from the atmosphere permanently. So watch this space, <laughs> stay tuned on perovskites. And the good thing is, okay, there's special rocks out of the Ural Mountains. Well, when, what happens when we run out? They can be synthesized, so you don't have to worry about scarcity issues. Here's the rundown on the, the first big thing, solarizing the whole world. I'm just gonna, I talked about this in a TED talk from 2011 that you can check out on the web. But the sun, the wind, these are all solar-derived energy sources, the waves which come from the winds. Falling water, which was raised into the sky by the heat of the sun. Green plants, which grew by the light of the sun. And this, this is where we're getting into the agriculture and the bio. Even the uh, vast reserves of energy in the oceans, the temperature difference between the surface sun-warmed layers and the cold depths can be exploited for immense amounts of energy. And the tides, now this is lunar power. Still sky power, though. <laughs> lunar power. And then here's earth power, the heat of the earth, geothermal. All of these solar-derived renewable green energy sources are clean, limitless, homegrown, and democratically distributed. Sky power to the people. All of these together 
bring in enough energy in one hour to the planet to far exceed the demand of all of humanity for a whole year. This is the annual energy coming in from the sun, that great big cube. And down on the lower right there, that little tiny black cube, that's the annual use by all of humanity. And then those squares over on the left, those aren't the annual anything. Those are the total remaining reserves in the ground of the fossil and fissile fuels. So, I mean, there's good news here and lots of it. <laughs> so, um, you know, on all this stuff, uh, I just say, let a thousand flowers bloom. <laughs> and this is kind of like our mission to planet Earth. There's this term at NASA called terraforming Mars, you know, the idea that we could make Mars more Earth-like. Well, we need to terraform Earth, <laughs> make the Earth more Earth-like, make Earth great again. <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, the last question, the last question here is, do you have any inspirational images or thoughts and ideas for us? Yes. <laughs> One of my favorite, great movie, you gotta see this for the music if nothing else, is uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? How many of you have seen that? You know, the George Clooney uh, escaped convict character, he keeps saying, we're in a tight spot. Remember that? We're in a tight spot. <laughs> well, I'm saying, hey, we're all in a tight spot. We need to figure out a way out. Now, when I was a kid, I saw this wonderful, elaborately drawn, quaint cartoon on morning cartoons, you know. It was this legend of a bunch of Chinese brothers who all had magical powers, and they could come to the rescue in extremely dire circumstances. Do you remember? One of them could swallow the sea. You know, he could drink the ocean. This is the kind of outlandish magnitude that we need to be thinking and acting big. And don't, don't take no for an answer. Do you know how you're always seeing kids drawing you know, solutions to various problems, imaginative? We all need to be doing that. We, get, we have to encourage that in the society. And a big key to that, by the way, is massive funding for R&D, research and development. That's what really got us to the kind of nice place we've all been able to live in. For, and, and we're kind of, uh, you know, shrinking on that now. We need to really play with the universe, <laughs> come to understand how it works and how it can benefit us. I liken our uh, predicament to uh, Ernest Shackleton and his men who were stranded in the Antarctic for nearly two years. They accomplished the most astounding, incredible escape from extremely dire circumstances and just grim prospects in the history of the human race. And, you know, they were not having fun, but they must have had deep flames of hope burning inside of them. And we kind of need to have that same spirit. And in that spirit, I want to end with a quote from the late, great Vannevar Bush, who is known to many as the father of the modern computer. But it's this beautiful quote. And that's Vannevar Bush. And here's the quote. Do birds sing for the joy of singing? I believe they do. The complexity of their songs is far greater than is necessary for recognition or marking of reserved areas. I've become acquainted with a catbird who obviously des derives pleasure as he tries out little phrases on his own. Moreover, I believe evolution produced bird songs and the joy that goes with them for the survival value they bestow. She who struggles with joy in her heart struggles the more keenly because of that joy. Gloom dulls and blunts the attack. We are not the first to face problems, and as we face them, we can hold our heads high. So keep an eye on the sky, folks, and thank you for everything you do out there. And good night. <laughs>